Okay, now we'll go through the multiple choice solutions. Plus, I also have a sort of free response to them at the end just to get a little extra practice on geometric and binomial distributions. Um, you'll probably find the math chart helpful and the staplet applets, but I will also occasionally show you some of the calculator functions. So, uh, a psychologist studied the number of puzzles that subjects were able to solve in a five minute period while listening to soothing music. Let X be the number of puzzles completed successfully by a randomly chosen subject. The psychologist found that X had the probability distribution pictured in this table. What is the probability that a randomly chosen subject completes more than the expected number of puzzles in the five minute period while listening to music? So the first thing you have to do is you go ahead and you calculate the expected values. So we just did that by multiplying each value times its probability adding them up and we get 2.3. 2.3 falls in here. So we just add the 0.3 and the 0.1 and that gives us 0.4. So that's it for number four. Number five, the standard deviation of X is 0.9. Which of the following is the best interpretation of this value? So you really need to remember that standard deviation is the typical distance between the mean and the data points. So Again, it's the typical distance between the mean and the data points, and the one that shows that is this first choice, A. All right? So the number of puzzles solved by subjects typically differed from the mean by about 0.9 puzzles. I accidentally had subjects typically differed from one another. You want to make sure that word mean is in the, the description there. Now let D be the difference in the number of puzzles solved by two randomly selected subjects in a five minute period. What is the standard deviation of D? So this is a, actually a combination of variables because we're saying subject one minus subject two. Well, I'm not really too worried. Is it one minus two or two minus one? But I do know I'm taking the two measurements and I'm subtracting them. Now, so since we are combining variables, I must, must, must work in variance. And so I'm going to take the variance of D, it's going to be the variance of X1 plus the variance of X2. Now I know you see a minus there and you want to subtract, just like we did in the casino problem, or like you wanted to on your quiz. This is actually um, that question on the back side of the quiz, the green one that you took at the beginning of this unit. But what you actually always do, we never subtract variances when combining variables. We always add them. Now, 0.9 is the standard deviation of the two, all right? And how did I find that? Well, I could have basically put this in the discrete random variable staplet, and you can see that the standard deviation is 0.9. And I think we actually just mentioned that 0.9 was a standard deviation in the previous problem, right? There it is. It's 0.9. But in case you're wondering, there it is. Okay. So I have 0.9 as a standard deviation both times, so I'm gonna square it to get variance, or I basically have two of them and I get 1.62. But I need standard deviation, so I need to make sure I take the square root of that, and that gives me 1.27 is the correct answer. On to number seven. Suppose a student is randomly selected from your school, which of the following pairs of random variables are most likely independent? Independent means that one should not affect the other. And I'm going to su suspect it's not 100%, but IQ and GPA, that makes sense. PSAT, verbal and math, they're probably linked. Kids who are very studious are probably going to do well in both. Kids who are not paying as much attention are probably going to do not as well in both. Not to say that you couldn't have a non-studious kid have a really high PSAT score, but they're mostly kind of related, right? The um, average amount of homework the student does per night, probably related to the GPA. And a student's height is probably related to their weight. Not perfectly, but probably. On the other hand, the average amount of homework the student does per night, probably not related to the student's height. So those are most likely independent. A certain vending machine offers 20 ounce bottles of soda per buck 50. The number of bottles X bought from the machine on any day is a random variable with mean 50 and standard deviation 15. Let the random variable Y equal the total revenue from this machine on a randomly selected day. Assume that the machine works properly and that no sodas are stolen from the machine. What are the mean and standard deviation of Y? 
So we know the mean is 50 bottles and the standard deviation is 15 bottles. I have an equation of my profit's going to be a buck 50 per soda. So I'm going to take a buck 50 and multiply it by the number of bottles of soda. And my expected value is going to behave very nicely, no matter what kind of uh, situation I'm dealing with here, whether it's transforming or combining. Hopefully you see this is transforming because I'm just taking the variable and ma manipulating it. And so I can basically just take a buck 50 times the expected value of X, which is 50 bottles, and I expect to get $75 profit. So again, this is a transformation because I'm just taking one variable and plugging in it into an equation and getting another value. So also, because this is a transformation, I can avoid working with variance. Um, I can just um, multiply the standard deviation directly. So I can take that buck 50 and multiply it by the 15 and get 2250. So again, transformations behave pretty well. Uh, the exception is add, subtract on transformations. you got to remember to ignore that for spread or standard deviation. Number nine, the weight of tomatoes chosen at random from a bin at the farmer's market follows a normal distribution with a mean of 10 ounces and a standard deviation of one ounce. Suppose we pick four tomatoes at random from the bin and find their total weight. And this, they say the random variable uh, T is... And let's see, it does say we follow a normal distribution. So first of all, I know it's not binomial. So don't worry about the binomial part. Okay, we said it was a normal distribution. So one thing is T is X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus X4. It's not, I measure one tomato, multiply that weight by four to get the total weight. I have to put all four tomatoes together. So this is a combining situation, not critical for when calculating the expected value because they behave the same for transforming and combining. So I'm going to take the mean of the first tomato of the, or the expected value for the first tomato and the second and the third and the fourth and add them up. But they're all the same number. So it's just four times my mean, which is four times 10 or 40 ounces. Because this is combining four different tomatoes, we must use variance and not standard deviation. So I'm going to write variance of T is variance of X plus the first tomato and the second and the third and the fourth, which is basically, since they all have the same variance, uh, we say four times the variance of X or four. And remember, variance is the standard deviation squared, which in this case, one squared is still one. So there you go. Uh, and you get four. But to get the standard deviation, I have to take the square root of that and I actually have X should be variance of T in there. Um, we get equal square root of four, which is two. So it's approximately normal with mean 40 ounces and standard deviation of two ounces. Number 10, which of the following random variables is geometric? So geometric is, um, it's geometric if it is attempted until your first success. There are a couple here, like so here I'm getting two sixes, I've got the number of sevens, the number of sixes, these are not first successes, so you can cross those off, all right? So we're left with these two, the number of digits I read in a randomly selected row of the random digits table to get a seven, or the number of cards I deal from a well-shuffled deck of 52 cards to get a heart. Now, these are both binomial because you either get a seven or you don't. You get a heart or you don't. But the second scenario, because it said a well-shuffled deck of 52 cards, that's not as huge a number of cards as you think it is, in terms of the probability of hearts. So that is going to change as we draw cards out of the deck. So that's not independent. So we're going to cross this one off. And if the answer is, in that case, that one, by the process of elimination, the answer is A. 17 people have been exposed to a particular disease. Each one independently has a 40% chance of contracting the disease. A hospital has a capacity to handle 10 cases of the disease. What is the probability that the hospital's capacity will be exceeded? Okay, so this is a binomial distribution. N is 17 and P is 0.4, right? And we're trying to figure out the probability that it's more than 10. So one thing we want to do is say, what are the cases? Oh, that means if it's 11 or 12 or 13, all the way up to 17, all right? Now, I can go use Staplet 
and say, hey, n is 17, this p is 0.4, and then I can tell it 11 and higher. So you can see that the box is around the 11 all the way to the 17, and it does give you a value of 0 0.0348. Now, also, I just want to make sure that I show calculator here occasionally. With the calculator, it doesn't do boxes to the right like this. It will do one to the left, though. So what I could do is do the probability of 0 to 10, right? And that's the cumulative distribution function. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to plug in these values. N is 17, or trials is 17. P is 0.4, and X is 10. And then when you go 1 minus that value, you get the same thing with the staplet spit out, which is 0 0.0348, which is basically 0.035. On to number 12, the figure shows the probability distribution of a discrete random variable x. Which of the following best describes this random variable? Well, first of all, this is not geometric. Geometric, actually, it, if you think about it, let's say the probability is 0 0.1 on geometric, right? So the probability of failure is 0.9, okay? So if you get success on your first try, you start out with 0.1, okay, so it's 0.1. Now let's say you fail on the first try and then you succeed on the second one. Guess what, it's 0.9 times 0.1, which is 0.09, which is smaller than 0.1. If you fail twice and then succeed, so this is um, x is three, you get 0.9 times 0.9, 0.81. <coughs> times 0.1, so it's 0.081. So it's always descending. <coughs> Geometric distributions look like exponentials that are just going down to the right. Okay, so it's not geometric. It's definitely a binomial, and I'm going to say the expected value somewhere in here. So what I'm just going to do is calculate um, expected values uh, for each scenario. So expected value for choice A is NP, 8 times 0.3 is 2.4. For B, it's 0.8, and for C, it's 6.4. Well, you can clearly see that the expected value is not as low as 0.8, and it's not as high as 6.4. It is, and in fact, when I plug these in the staplet, just to check them, I plugged in N is 8, uh, N is 8 and P is 0.3, and you can see we have a match. So the choice is A. Number 13, a test for extrasensory perception, ESP, involves asking a person to tell which of five shapes, a circle, star, triangle, diamond, or heart, appears on a hidden computer screen. On each trial, the computer is equally likely to select any of the five shapes. Suppose researchers are testing a person who does not have, pretend that says ESP, and so is just guessing on each trial. What is the probability that the person guesses the first four shapes incorrectly, but gets the fifth one correct? So you don't have to worry about binomial here because they're doing the order exactly. They're telling you incorrect, 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 correct. So we're talking about just one way to get this. So I basically do the probabilities for incorrect four times, not times four, but four listed four times, and then one-fifth is the last thing. So that's four to the fifth to the four times one-fifth. So the correct answer on this one is D. Mr. Lee has just collected his last batch of 24 English essays, all of them as computer files. He's curious about how long the papers are, but he doesn't want to be fooled by large font sizes, so he uses the word processing software word count feature. Below is a histogram of the word counts for the 24 essays. Which of the following best describes the, uh, the distribution? So obviously they're saying skew, and you can see this is skewed to the right. So I can cross off everybody that says skewed left. Now I just have to figure out if it's centered at 750 or 850. Now it's you're probably going, hey, the peak's close to 750, but I'm going to go ahead and get my median just to be certain. Well, there are 24 essays, so the median is between points 12 and 13. I'm going to just add up how many points cumulative I have in each pile. So the first bin, I have two. Then I add four more, I'm up to point six. I add six more, I'm up to point 12. And then I add five more, and I'm up to point 17. So the median is actually some halfway value between the last number in this bin and the first number in that bin. So it's definitely not 850, that's over here. 
So it's somewhere around 750. So your answer is A. Number 15, Mrs. Barnes records the values of several variables for each student in her, in her class. These include variables listed below. Which of these variables is categorical? So score on the final exam out of 200 points. That's quantitative. Final grade for the course. Well, I'm pretty sure that's categorical, right? Because A, B, C, D. It's not like you're giving an actual number. You just gave a letter category. Total number of points earned in the class, quantitative. Number of lectures student missed, quantitative. Amount of time, quantitative. So our answer is B, the letter grade for the course. The five number summary of test scores for the 600 students in Mrs. Hughes' st statistics class in Providence School is 52, 65, 78, 85, and 96. Roughly how many students scored 65 or lower? So we know 65 is Q at Q1. We're gonna guess about 25% of the students scored a 65 or lower. And 25% of 600 is basically 0.25 times 600 or 150. So that's roughly. And the reason we don't know if it's exactly, we could have a couple of 65s between Q1 and the median. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, we know that our median is at 78, so it doesn't go all the way up to the median, but we don't know how high up the, the 65 goes. So that's why it's roughly. Number 17. Rainwater was collected in water containers at 30 different sites near an industrial complex, and the amount of acidity, pH level, was measured. The mean and standard deviation of values are 4.60 and 1.10, respectively. When the pH meter was recalibra recalibrated back at the laboratory, it was found to be an error. The error can be corrected by adding 0.1 pH unit to all the values and then multiplying the result by 1.2. What are the mean and standard deviation of the correct pH measures? So this is definitely, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add 0.1 to everything. So I'm kind of listing that first on purpose. So we take our value, add 0.1, so whatever that is, and then multiply that by 1.2. Now I could distribute this and rewrite this as a different equation, and that could make things a little easier to understand. But it's not that big a deal. So expected value, this is a transformation, because I'm taking all the values and do, running them through this equation. So my expected value will be nice. Um, it's e to the x plus 0.1 and multiply that by 1.2. Uh, 1 4.60 plus 0.1 is 4.7 times 1.2 is 5.64. So we know it's a couple of these over here, options, and that kind of makes sense. All right. Then standard deviation, I'm basically going to take that same equation, but here's a difference. That plus 0.1 doesn't do anything to affect spread, right? So we ignore it. I completely get rid of it. So I just have 1.2x basically. And so that's 1.2 times my standard deviation. So I just do 1.2 times 1.10 and I get 1.32. Remember on transformations, ignore adding constants or subtracting constants uh, when getting your standard deviation for the transformation. Okay. So ignore plus or minus of constants for SD. Make sure you write that on your cheat sheet, or cheat card, I should say. All right, problem 18. Suppose the probability that a light bulb is defective is 0.06. You take a sample of 150 light bulbs from the production line. Let X equal the number of defective bulbs. So the question is, uh, is this binomial or geometric, and how do you know? So first of all, P is uh, 0.06, so X is the number defective out of 150. And it's binomial because the outcomes are binary, either defective or not. Outcomes are independent. Getting one defective light bulb is defective does not affect the probability the next bulb is defective. The number of trials is fixed. It's not like I'm pulling light bulbs till I find a defective one. I am checking exactly 150 light bulbs. And S, you know my little pet peeve, it feels the same as independent. The probability is the same and it doesn't change. All right. So what is the probability that exactly 10 light bulbs are defective? So I, on Staplet, I would put in 150. Uh, make sure you know your N and your P. That's important. And then X in this case is going to be 10. N and P should stay pretty much the same for your whole scenario. And then, uh, I mean, unless they switch to the complement. So be careful there. 
um, but x's will change from problem to problem. So here's my equation, and basically, oh, sorry guys, this looks horrible. It's 15, 150, choose 10, times 0.06 to the 10th, times 0.94 to the 140th, which is horrible. Or you could just say binome PDF, and it's 150, P is 0.06, X is 10, and it will give you 0.1223. And also you can see here, when I did it on the staplet, exactly 10 successes, I got 12.23%, okay? Calculate and interpret the expected value for X. Well, I'm going to use this formula from your math chart. The mean for a binomial distribution is N times P, 150 times 0.06, which is 9. So for many samples of 150 light bulbs, we would expect to find, on average, 9 defective bulbs. So remember how to interpret. If I ask you to interpret and you don't write something, then you did not answer that part of the question. Now calculate and interpret the standard deviation for x. So the formula is a little bit yuckier, all right? It's the square root of np times 1 minus p. So if I do all that, I get 2.909. And remember, standard deviation is the typical difference or distance between the mean and your data points. So for many samples of 150 light bulbs, the number of defective bulbs would typically vary about 2.909 bulbs from the mean of 9. Lots of nines there. Sorry about that. Okay, could we use a normal model to approximate the binomial distribution? So if you look at the plot, it is looking sort of good. Let's see. Well, didn't we say the expected value was nine? We're right on the edge. We're right on the edge. If we had had 10, we could say yes. But because we're right on nine, and you can see there's a teensy bit of skew, not much. Um, but it, we would really need a slightly larger sample to uh, get a use a binomial approximation here. So it's slightly skewed to the right. Okay, suppose uh, that the probability that the light bulb is defective is still 0.06. So now we're on problem 19. Oh, wait, no, we're still doing, uh, oh, you're, you're taking, no, I'm not going to do 150 samples from the, well, I guess so. You can take a sample of 150 light bulbs from the production line, but the number of light bulbs you expect until you find a defective one. So we're look, talking about a slightly different scenario here. I'm not trying to count how many are defective. I'm counting how many light bulbs do I inspect until I find the first defective one. So which model is this? Hopefully you know it's geometric. So P is 0.06. Why is the number of light bulbs inspected till first defect? It's geometric, well, our outcomes are still binary, our outcomes are still independent, but now we're looking for first success, not the number of um, uh, defective light bulbs. Calculate the probability the first defective light bulb you find is the 12th one. So that is the form, uh, there's your geometric distribution formula right here. So X is going to be 12, P is still 0.06. And basically, I, and 12 minus 1 is 11. That's where that 11 is coming from. And there's your 0.06. And you get 0.0304 or 3.04% probability. All right? Calculate and ex interpret the expected value of y. So we're going to use this part of the formula here. So we do 1 over p, 1 over 0.06, which is 16.67. And if we were to interpret it, we say over many samples, we would ex expect to inspect about, wow, that rhymes, about 16.67 bulbs to f before finding, when we find the first effective bulb. So we would expect to find the first effective bulb right around.